The earth speaks in a language of pressure and release, a dialect of violent shudders that we, with our short memories, often fail to translate until it is too late. But this week, the earth is not whispering, it is screaming. We are currently witnessing a sequence of events that has seismologists and geologists across the globe staring at their monitors in uneasy silence. The date is December 11, 2025. In the last 96 hours, the Pacific Ring of Fire, that volatile horseshoe of trenches and volcanoes that strangles the Pacific Ocean, has woken up with a coordinated ferocity we haven't seen in decades. It began on December 6th in the cold remote wilderness of the Yukon-Alaska border. A magnitude 7.0 earthquake tore through the crust. While the location was remote, the geological signal was loud. The North American plate took a massive hit, a violent shudder that sent stress waves cascading southward. Just 48 hours later, on December the 8th, the other side of the ocean answered. A massive magnitude 7.6 earthquake struck the Ryukyu Islands of Japan. To the layperson, these might seem like two isolated headlines, a quake in the frozen north and a quake in the tropical west, distinct, unrelated, bad luck. But to those who study the architecture of our planet, this is not a coincidence. It is a pincer movement. The Pacific Plate is grinding, twisting, and locking, and two massive release valves have just blown on opposite sides of the rim. This brings us to the terrifying question that is currently circulating in the backrooms of emergency management agencies from Seattle to San Francisco. Is the West Coast of the United States next? To understand the gravity of this moment, we must look away from the flashing red dots on today's earthquake map and look instead at a remarkable, almost cinematic story of accidental discovery. A story that fundamentally changed what we know about the big one. For generations, we believed that earthquakes were solitary beasts. We thought the San Andreas Fault in California and the Cascadia Subduction Zone in the Pacific Northwest were neighbors that ignored each other. One might rupture, causing devastation, but the other would remain asleep. We took comfort in that separation. We built our cities, our bridges, and our emergency plans based on the idea that we would only have to fight one monster at a time. We were wrong. And we only know we were wrong because of a mistake. Several years ago, a research vessel operated by Oregon State University was trawling the waters off the coast of the Pacific Northwest. The mission was routine. The lead researcher, Dr. Chris Goldfinger, had a specific plan to study a known area of the seafloor. But in the chaotic environment of a working ship, a simple human error occurred. An undergraduate student, perhaps tired or distracted, mistyped the longitude coordinates into the ship's navigation system. The ship didn't go where it was supposed to. It drifted miles off, course, into a region of the deep ocean that no one had intended to study. By the time the mistake was realized, the ship had already deployed its coring equipment. Heavy hollow tubes dropped miles down to punch into the seabed and pull up columns of mud. Instead of discarding the mistaken samples, the team decided to analyze them. What they found inside those tubes of mud was a geological Rosetta Stone. You see, the ocean floor is like a history book. Over thousands of years, sediment settles in slow, predictable layers, like dust accumulating in an abandoned house. But when a massive earthquake strikes, a megathrust event, it triggers massive underwater landslides. Millions of tons of dirt and rock rush down the continental slope, settling in a chaotic, thick layer called a turbidite. By counting these layers, scientists can build a timeline of past earthquakes. When Dr. Goldfinger and his team looked at the core samples from the accidental location, they saw the expected turbidites from the Cascadia subduction zone. They saw the evidence of the great quake of 1700. They saw the quake of 1400, but then they noticed something that made their blood run cold. In the southern part of the fault line, where the Cascadia zone nears the San Andreas Fault, the layers were different. They weren't single layers. 
They were doublets. A doublet is a geological smoking gun. It showed two distinct earthquake layers settling on top of each other, separated by only a thin film of silt that represented a very short amount of time. In geological terms, short can mean years, but often it means hours or days. The implications were staggering. The data suggested that the San Andreas Fault and the Cascadia subduction zone are not isolated. They are mechanically coupled. The samples proved that at least 13 times in the last 3,000 years, a rupture on one fault has triggered a rupture on the other. Imagine the San Andreas snapping, tearing apart Southern California. The shock waves travel north, hitting the locked zone of Cascadia like a hammer striking a bell. The Cascadia Fault, already under immense strain, can't handle the added pressure. It unzips. Suddenly, the entire West Coast, from Los Angeles to Vancouver, is engulfed in a synchronized catastrophe. This is the domino effect that experts are fearing right now. Let's return to the present day. December 2025. Why are the quakes in Alaska and Japan so concerning in light of this doublet theory? The Earth's crust is a system of stress transfer. When the quake hit Alaska on December 6th, it didn't just release energy, it moved it. It shifted the burden of the Pacific Plate's movement onto the adjacent fault lines. Then Japan ruptured. The plate is rotating, jostling for position. The one area that has remained eerily, suspiciously quiet in this recent sequence is the Cascadia subduction zone. Cascadia has been silent for 325 years? The last time it ruptured was January 26, 1700. We, oh, know the exact date, not because of local records. The indigenous peoples of the Northwest kept the history and oral tradition. But because of Japan. On that day in 1700, a mysterious tsunami destroyed coastal villages in Japan. There had been no earthquake felt there. The samurai and merchants called it the Orphan Tsunami. It wasn't until modern geology connected the dots that we realized the parent of that wave was a magnitude 9.0 earthquake that shattered the Pacific Northwest of America. The average interval for a Cascadia rupture is roughly 240 years. We are now at year 325. We are pregnant with disaster. The fault is locked, accumulating stress at a rate of 40 millimeters per year. That may sound small, but over three centuries, that is 13 meters of pent-up movement. 13 meters of land that wants to jump forward, but is being held back by friction. When that friction gives way, it won't be a polite shudder. It will be the most violent geophysical event the continental United States has ever experienced. And now, with the accidental discovery of the doublet connection, we have to grapple with the reality that it might trigger the San Andreas as well. This week's activity, the 7.6 in Japan, the 7.0 in Alaska, acts as a warning shot. The Pacific plate is restless. The boundaries are slipping. We are seeing a redistribution of mass on a planetary scale. The science tells us that earthquakes cannot be predicted with the precision of weather forecasts. We cannot say that next Tuesday at 2 Sankar p.m. the ground will open up. But we can forecast probability. And we can observe patterns. The pattern we are seeing this week is one of encirclement. The energy is moving around the ring, ping-ponging across the ocean, looking for the weak points. For the millions of people living in the Pacific Northwest in California, this is not a time for panic, but it is a time for profound awareness. The ground beneath your feet is not solid. It is a raft floating on a sea of molten rock, and the raft is currently colliding with the rest of the world. The accidental discovery of those mud cores changed the narrative. It stripped away the comfort of isolation. It showed us that the faults are talking to each other. The question is, are we listening? As we watch the rescue crews in Japan and Alaska begin their work, we must look at the silence of our own fault lines, not as safety, but as suspense. The energy released in Japan has to go somewhere. The stress shifted by the Alaska quake has to be absorbed. The physics of the planet demands equilibrium. 
The terrifying beauty of geology is that it operates on a timeline that dwarfs human existence. To the Earth, 325 years is a blink of an eye. The synchronization of the San Andreas and Cascadia is a heartbeat. But to us, it is everything. The big one is no longer a singular noun. It is a plural. And as the ring of fire lights up this December, the evidence suggests that the dominoes are lined up, waiting for the uh, final push. The research ship went to the wrong place, but it found the right answer. We are more connected and more vulnerable than we ever dared to imagine. Stay vigilant. Stay prepared. Because the Earth is moving and the sequence has begun.